Hi! So good to see you! I didn't recognize you! <laughs> Hidden. It's so good to be back! Yeah! It looks amazingly similar even though it's in a different building.
Only in May, but I think last year it was in April. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's wrapped up, it's fair game. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Alright, so you guys in the seminar, um, the Family Family Director of the Security Studies Program. Today it's my real great pleasure to welcome uh, back uh, to MIT uh, SSP Jennifer Lin, who's an Associate Professor uh, in Dartmouth College, uh, at Dartmouth College in the Department of Government, uh, Faculty Associate at Harvard University's Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies, and an Associate Fellow at Adam House uh, in the UK. Uh, especially excited because she received her PhD uh, from MIT. Uh, and was a very active member of the Security Studies program uh, during her time here. Uh, she's the author of Starry States, Apologies in International Politics, a book that examines uh, the effect of war memory on international relations. She's uh, authored scholarly articles on international security and the International Studies Quarter, Quarterly, among many other outlets, and writes to wider audiences and outlets such as foreign affairs that have been of interest. Uh, she has worked as a consultant for Iran and for the Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, and is currently writing a book about the speed and complexity with which uh, great powers, excuse me, with, with which countries rise to become great powers. Today she's going to talk about authoritarian, authoritarian at the cutting edge, China, innovation, and the global uh, balance of power. So, Vinny, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Taylor. It's really, really fun to be back here at MIT. Um, I see a fair number of my dissertation committee assembled. Although they're, you know, stealthily masked, so it's hard to recognize people after all this time. Um, <laughs> it's it's really wonderful to see folks, and and I love seeing all the students here, and I'm really excited to hopefully get to know you guys a bit and learn about your work. And you know, I'm at MIT North, um, as we call it, Dartmouth. So just come up anytime, and um, be be great to see you guys. So what I'm presenting today is material from my latest book project, and I am finishing this up and hopefully submitting it to publishers in January, but there's still time, obviously, in the endless process of revisions that we do in our profession, uh, there's still definitely time for incorporating comments, so I'm really excited to get feedback from all of you guys today. So the, the question that I'm interested in for the book project is about China's rise to great power and whether or not clickers function when they're supposed to. Um, 
Okay, so, so obviously so many things of interest with respect to China's rise to we IR scholars. Um, I'm interested in particular in whether China's rise is going to transform the global balance of power that we have seen basically a, a situation of American dominance since the fall of the Soviet Union. And obviously the answer to this question has key implications for a lot of things we really care about for the stability of international politics, for US-China relations, stability and future of American alliances, uh, the character of international order, and the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism. So if there is going to be another great power, it has pretty important implications for all of these things. Um, the question then is, can China rise to great power? And maybe already is China a great power? Uh, in the debate right now, you see answers from everything to China is a great power, to China can never be a great power, to China is the greatest power the world has ever seen, to China is in decline. So that basically sums up the landscape. So the, the, the punchline is there's no agreement whatsoever on this question, and yet I encounter a remarkable degree of certainty from people expressing all of those different viewpoints. So anyway, um, let's talk about what a great power is, and then we'll talk about how one gets there. So great powers need to have a combination of both scale and sophistication in terms of their material capabilities. So in terms of scale, great powers need demographic, economic, and military size. They need to have the largest populations or, or very large populations. They need to have large scale in terms of their economy, so the aggregate size of their economy, and they need to have significant military force. In addition, you can't just be big, right? You also have to have technological sophistication. So there's that element too. Then great powers historically we see have uh, the world's cutting edge technology, which provides commercial advantages for their economies and also allows them to um, have particular advantages on the battlefield when they're fighting other great powers. So it's this combination of both scale and sophistication. Now, China certainly has the scale in terms of demographics, in terms of the size of its economy, which is first or second in the world, depending on how you, how you um, calculate it. Uh, obviously, it lags the US in terms of overall military power, but most would agree that in a given, uh, a given situation like a war over Taiwan, for example, China has tremendous military forces that it would bring to bear in a war against the United States. So generally, the debate has focused with respect to China as a great power, the debate has focused on technology. Does China have the technological sophistication uh, to, to match the United States? And there's, there's two narratives that one hears about this. One is the, a recent narrative, and this is the China as 10 feet tall narrative. Um, you guys know what it's like to write these long book projects or dissertation projects. And as somebody who started this book, when people were saying China can't innovate, China can never innovate, this one that's happened in recent years has been one I've had to adjust to. <laughs> it kind of came out of nowhere for me. So anyway, but the China is 10 foot tall syndrome is one that you hear frequently from industry, from the media, um, and a lot from the, the DC community. And basically the argument here, and, and for example, Eric Schmidt has written reports and op-eds on this a lot, saying that America essentially has been falling behind while China has been surging ahead and that the United States now is in a situation where we're having to play catch up with respect to China and particularly uh, technologies at the, the frontier. So that's the China's eating our lunch narrative that's very much out there. The other narrative is the complete opposite. And this is the one that sort of my crew typically holds. So in international relations scholarship, you hear this one much more often. Um, so the skeptical case says that China actually faces a that gap in capabilities and wealth. So technological capabilities and then overall wealth vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And so some people have done some pretty sophisticated studies to make this argument. So basically this is the like Dartmouth 
bullet point. <laughs> so everybody there is either my colleague or did a lot of this work while at Dartmouth. So yeah, we have some interesting lunchtime conversations. Um, so people have looked at various technology indicators and concluded China's very far behind. And so um, that's one kind of study that you see the more the kind of sophisticated studies have looked at actual tried to look at indicators and made this argument. Other people tend to use a proxy and they say, well, let's just look at GDP per capita. And GDP per capita, they argue, conveys a lot of information about a country's level of wealth and level of technological development. And they say, wow, China is number 81 in the world in terms of GDP per capita, US is number 11. That's a really big gap. And so that's another point that you frequently see um, people making this argument that China's far behind. There's another part of the skeptical case, which is not only is there a big gap, but China's going to have a lot of trouble closing this gap because of the nature of its domestic institutions, namely because of its authoritarian institutions, which are said to inhibit innovation. And so you hear this a lot um, in terms of people who emphasize a democratic advantage, IR scholars, for example. Um, you also see this underpinned by a lot of theory from uh, multidisciplinary literature on institutions, growth, and innovation. And so again, uh, people who talk about inclusive or open access institutions and the effect that that has on encouraging growth and innovation, as opposed to what are called um, extractive or closed access institutions. So again, the skeptical case says really big gap between China and the United States and China's not going to be able to close it because of this institutional environment that they'll, they'll have to work in. All right, so let me just preview my argument, which is I'm going to be arguing today that China has actually risen to rank among the world's most innovative countries. This is obviously kind of a surprise, particularly a surprise for <laughs> this big literature that says that's just not going to be possible given its domestic institutions, given the extractive or closed access nature of its domestic institutions. So um, in, in the book project, I make both of these points. I, I talk about China developing great power. And then I say this represents kind of a puzzle for, you know, given this, this idea that we have about China's institutions, how was this possible? And I make an argument about Beijing has done this through what I call smart authoritarianism. So that's where I'm headed today. And let me just tell you in the rest of the talk, I'm first gonna talk about what is innovation and how do we measure it, some drivers of innovation, and then laying out this institutional argument about what causes, or sorry, about the, uh, the domestic climate for creating innovation and how uh, China's is going to be more difficult given its authoritarian institutions. I'll then turn to the empirics of the China case and so I'll talk about measuring Chinese innovation and then showing that China is becoming a very innovative country. Obviously, this raises a puzzle of, okay, well, how did China do that? And so I will introduce this argument about smart authoritarianism. Okay. All right, what is innovation? It feels kind of ridiculous to stand here at MIT and tell people what innovation is. Um, you guys are telling the world what innovation is. And so actually it's really kind of funny that I walked out of here with a dissertation about apologies and then come back and, and giving a talk on innovation. But something happened in between. It's like you can take the girl out of MIT, but you know, there you go. So anyway, what is innovation? So innovation is the discovery, introduction or development of new technology or the adaptation of established technology to a new use or new environment. The, the last part of this definition is really important. A lot of times people tend to conflate invention with innovation, which creates a much more narrow idea about what innovation is. Um, I've been very busy reading the work of my grad school colleagues in recent years. Uh, Zach Taylor, who was here at SSP with me, Doug Fuller, Dan Bresnitz, all of these guys walked these halls with me and I can't tell you how much I've learned from them. So um, so if your students look around and you just have no idea, like the, the colleagues work you may be drawing on in the future, if not already. 
anyway, um, Zach Taylor has this wonderful book on, on innovation, and he and Bresnitz actually make this point that uh, it's particularly important to understand that the innovation is, is much broader than what we typically envision. And so I think this is an important insight when we're talking about Chinese innovation, because there are ways in which China is extremely innovative in this latter part, right, in terms of adapting existing technology to new uses and new environments. All right. All right. So when scholars measure innovation, they look generally at several different metrics. So first of all, I'm interested in the extent to which a country is innovative, so national level innovation. Innovation occurs at all, all different levels, right? So it, we could be talking about firm level innovation, what makes a particular company innovative or not. We could be talking about um, people, we could talk about what makes for innovative employees or, or not. So there's all these different levels at which this vast innovation literature is interested in this subject. But I'm looking at countries, what makes countries innovative or not. And, and how can we assess to what extent a country is innovative? So in the innovation literature, scholars typically look at two main baskets of metrics. So the first is inputs into innovation. This is basically how much a country is trying to create the conditions for innovative activity. So there's, again, I'm gonna talk about some different drivers of innovation. Is the country trying to create an environment in which innovation will thrive? And so some inputs that we assess as we're trying to see is a country providing this. We look at the size of their science and technology workforce. Basically, are they training workers to be skilled? Uh, do, do they encourage tertiary education is what it's called when we're talking about more high skilled human capital. We look at educational investment in general. We look at R&D spending. So those would all be inputs. There's, there's obviously others. I'm just giving you guys kind of a, a quick preview here. And then the other basket is innovation outputs, which is, OK, to what extent is a country actually producing innovation? None of these metrics is perfect. Basically, they, they all they, they each represent kind of a piece of innovative activity and they all do that imperfectly. So the idea is essentially triangulation so that the, the more of these metrics that show a piece of innovation going on, uh, the, the more you can be confident that this kind of activity is in fact going on. So one is patents, which is obviously uh, if an idea has been given a patent. The argument is, is this is something new, this is something with economic value. And so this is something that represents innovative activity. Patenting, there's all sorts of different ways to measure this. And uh, all, you know, with the China case, it's particularly problematic because like the, the government uh, subsidizes firms to file patents. And so then you start getting into, okay, well, how do we accurately measure what's going on? If we have a system in which there are subsidies for this behavior and in which maybe it, the process might be corrupted and right so this all gets very dicey so there's so as i've created this study i've had to think about how do we get around those kinds of problems so i'll talk about that in a minute so anyway patenting is a really important aspect of innovation and i should mention so that really is invention right so that really does capture that invention slice of what's going on uh, research is another dimension of this. So publications that a country's nationals are publishing, um, you, you could just count up journal articles. You could even limit that to science and technology fields. Uh, the problem is, is there's all these questionable journals out there. There's a, I know this is a, a, you know, a horrifying thought, but there might be articles that are not as good as other articles. Um, so, so how do we get at like high quality studies? And so basically the solution to that is to, to, uh, to, to look up how, uh, to, to what extent um, a study has been cited in the top 1% of citations. So top 1% of cited articles is a way of getting at, we think that probably conveys that there's some quality there. And then the, the third dimension is 
trying to capture actual commercialization of technology, not just that something has been invented, but that it's actually in the economy, it's adding value, it's being purchased and so on. So, so one dimension you can ask is like what percent of a country's manufacturing or of its exports is actually in the high technology realm. Okay, so those are all several different metrics in those input baskets and output baskets. All right, what causes innovation? What causes all that to happen? All right, this is one of the biggest questions in social science, so you're not going to get a definitive theory from me, uh, particularly not standing in the middle of MIT, as I said. Um, but there, there are several drivers that scholars have identified. Um, in Zach Taylor's book, he talks about pillars of innovation. Um, and so several of them are these. So one idea is property rights, that inventors and entrepreneurs need to know that they will benefit from their activity. Um, we can talk about intellectual property rights, but that's actually an overly limited view of things, that there are other ways that you can convey this to inventors. And so some economies, and actually China is one of them, manage to encourage invention, innovation, um, even in an absence of the kind of strong property rights that the more Washington consensus view would have expected. But essentially, it's solving this essential market failure, which is in a situation where somebody knows their technology is going to diffuse to people who had nothing to do with its creation, how do you reassure them that they will actually benefit? The second factor is capital. Research needs to be funded. Startups have to be started, right? So you need capital to get these going. Um, research and development budget is one aspect of that, but also private capital is an important other dimension. And then high skilled human capital. As I said, you need a really, really top workforce, very well trained, uh, not just high school, not just college, graduate school, connections to national laboratories, uh, all the amazing things that you have going on here at Kendall Square and in uh, Boston more broadly. Uh, indeed, this is where we are right now, is cited as one of the most innovative places in the globe in terms of a, a regional cluster. And part of that relates to this idea of, of network which is innovation thrives in networks, both in domestic clustering and globally with links to global knowledge networks. If you're working on some area and you're just, you know, if I was gonna write this paper and sit in you know, New Hampshire and up in the trees and work on this, it's probably not gonna be very good. So I wanna come down and talk to the people who know a lot of stuff about China and about innovation and that's gonna make it better because I'm networked with the people who are really working at the cutting edge. And so networks is a really important driver of this. The ease of reform is kind of a, a meta driver. This one basically relates to this idea, you've probably heard Schumpeter's description of innovation as creative destruction. This idea that you're creating something and destroying something. And so innovation essentially brings tremendous change to an economy. It creates new products. It sometimes creates and destroys whole sectors. Just so you know, when I started MIT, I had a Palm Pilot. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen a Palm Pilot? You know, some of, some of the folks here, yeah. But you know, where are the Palm Pilots these days? Like, they are no more. And so what happened to those firms? What happened to all those, like you could buy all these cases and all these like little pencils for them and all these accoutrements and like, where'd all that go? It got destroyed, right? It got destroyed by the smartphone industry. And so that destruction, that creation needs to be accommodated by a society. And so the, the better that a society is able to accommodate that, to, to bring new regulations, to change old regulations, to direct capital in new directions and so on, the, the more innovative that economy is going to be. Okay, so those are different drivers of innovation. And now let me get to this argument about what economies are going to be better at providing those conditions, at, at encouraging those drivers. So as I said, there's this institutions argument that says, Economic growth and innovation 
we, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with several different hypotheses on what drives economic growth. This particular one says, look at domestic institutions and the nature of those institutions are going to determine whether or not an economy thrives. And so scholars have said they, scholars have highlighted basically what they call inclusive institutions, also called open access institutions. Um, these can be political in terms of a people, a person's access to the government, like voting rights, for example, like access to information. These also can be economic. So there's different kinds of institution in a society. Actually, social institutions are a really important one too. Um, those are the ones that are, you know, this sort of like traditions and norms and so on. Um, so anyway, the, the scholarship here says, look at the nature of these institutions and that the, the countries that have more inclusive institutions in which more people are connected to their economy, more people are connected to their government, those countries are going to be more innovative. And they, the scholars who make these arguments about innovation and inclusive institutions draw sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly on several different mechanisms. And these are all connected back to those drivers that I identified earlier. So they say that democracies are more likely to provide public goods like tertiary education, like national laboratories, infrastructure, and so on. Um, those public goods are more likely to be administered by a meritocratic, competent civil service as opposed to one that is highly corrupt. And so again, this leads to better public good provision. Again, leading to that higher skilled human capital. Democracies are said to have more constraints on leaders. So for example, democratic leaders are said to be better at repaying debt, be less likely to intervene in monetary policy, um, respect central bank interference, for example, uh, less likely to mess around with exchange rates. And so for all those reasons, you see better macroeconomic stability in democracies that's said to attract capital and to reassure investors. So again, back to that capital dimension. Democracies are said to be more likely to be open in terms of the allowing the movement of people, allowing the, the spread of businesses, allowing students to go overseas, uh, and again, those connections to global networks. Democracies guarantee their people freedom and they have strong civil society. So freedom to express ideas, freedom to assemble, freedom to start businesses. Um, and then civil society serves as this kind of churn of ideas where a lot of innovation comes from, where society communicates problems and thinks about what kind of society it wants to be and where entrepreneurs bring solutions. And so again, this idea about this being a real kind of locus of innovation within democracies. And then democracies are also said to have a more, more flexible uh, ease of reform as opposed to autocracies in which you will find a lot of, a lot of arrangements, for example, uh, patronage relationships, um, corrupt networks of patronage where uh, like if you wanted to shut down that state-owned enterprise that would be a big problem for the the people who are in charge of it because they're enjoying the rents that come from that so you know if the palm pilot company were um, staffed by all your political cronies you wouldn't want to shut that down because that would be bad for you so we'd still be walking around with palm pilots all right so that's the argument about this democratic advantage and I should say also that it's a temporal claim as well. It's not just about these particular mechanisms, because I'm, I'm sure that some of you are sitting here thinking like, gosh, you know, Nazi Germany had really good technology. 19th century Germany had really good technology. No, wait a minute. So early Cold War Soviet Union was doing really well. Uh, so what, what, what does that all mean? And so people identify this as part of several different trends in the late 20th century. So one was the nature of technology itself, which is the advent of the information age in the early 1960s, which again is said to advantage societies that allow the spread of information. If information is at the center 
of this, what it was called the third industrial revolution, then societies that allowed the ease and the spread of information are going to do better. There was also the onset of a globalized uh, international order in terms of societies that could participate in that, that could send their businesses overseas, send people around, students around and so on, they would have an advantage. There was the rise of the human rights regime after World War II. So imagine if you're a, a dictator, if you are trying to um, impose control and you know, uh, mowing down people in the, the public square of your capital city, uh, this is going to be something that the international community is going to regard less and less favorably as the human rights regime gets going. And as the telecommunications are improving, they're going to be seeing this much to a much greater extent than they ever have. And then also with the rise of international institutions and the development regime, uh, there will be liberal leaders from the advanced liberal democracies that will be in the position to deny that country aid, deny it expertise and so on. So the potential for sanctions and so forth. So all of these trends are said to combine to create this democratic advantage in both growth and innovation. All right, um, I'm going to turn now to the empirics of the China case. And again, I'm not going to go through necessarily, I don't think I go through all of these, um, but I'm going to give you kind of a, a taste of these different, these different data on these different both inputs and output metrics. Um, as I show you a bunch of charts, you know, I, I don't want to impose like chart blindness on you. So, um, so just keep two things in mind, okay? First thing is follow the red line. So just like see what direction that's going. That's pretty interesting. The, the second is basically all I'm trying to convey to you with all of these charts and lines all over the place is that China is in the mix. That's it. I'm, I'm not saying China is 10 feet tall. I'm not saying anything else. I'm saying China is among these countries that we tend to think of as the world's most innovative. All right, let me start with inputs. So this is R&D spending, represented as a percentage of GDP. Follow that red line and you see that China has kind of climbed right into the, the middle of these countries that again, we think of as quite innovative with one of the largest GDPs in the world. This translates to China being second in the world in aggregate spending on research and development next to the United States. This is government. Yeah, this is government. All right, let me look at the, the potential workforce here, the level of human capital. This is science and technology PhDs. Uh, this is a realm in which China has seen really quite spectacular growth over time. So again, outpacing all of the folks down here and rising up to meet the basically the United States level. So um, the figures look pretty similar for bachelor's degrees, by the way. So in terms of creating a high tech workforce, creating a workforce that's equipped to innovate. China has been devoting a lot of energy to that. All right, now we're going to move over to outputs, and I'm going to show you a couple different patent indicators. Um, this is a kind of patent statistic that's called a triadic patent family. And what that means is, is that this is a patent that has been filed in the US Japanese and European patent offices simultaneously. So again, trying to get past this problem of how do you, how do you not count the lots of junky, <laughs> potentially junky Chinese patents that have been subsidized by the government to, for the firm to apply for them, right? So this is one way of kind of cutting through that. Uh, this is a, a quite costly thing for a firm to apply for. Um, and the, the numbers actually are pretty small, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But essentially what you see here is, is again, that the, um, here we go. So following that red line is that China has risen to the top of that clump 
of, again, countries that we think of as the world's most innovative. Um, this is a pretty interesting chart for lots of reasons, right? So, so look at up here. So Japan and the United States are, are just in a league all their own, which is really important to understand. Uh, and then China obviously doing increasingly well, well over time in this other group. So as I said, triadic patents are very expensive. It tends to be that only the biggest firms apply for them. And so it actually doesn't include a lot of patenting activity that's going on. Uh, yeah, patenting activity and innovative activity that's going on amongst the small and medium enterprises. And so I wanted to look at a few more different kinds of patent data just to get this picture. And so here's one more statistic that I'll show you, which is these are called international patents. And, and this is um, this is by the World Intellectual, World Intellectual Property Organization. And these are original patents that have been issued in any international jurisdiction. And it's just counted the first time that it's issued. And so here you see like, wow, China is performing to an extraordinary degree. Let's use kind of both of these charts to get the picture. So again, the, the first chart shows China looking quite respectable. This chart shows China performing at this kind of astounding uh, rate. And I would say the picture is somewhere in between there because again, this probably overcounts a lot of Chinese patents that maybe are not of the highest quality. And the previous chart probably undercounts a lot of innovative activity in China. So again, this is, we're just kind of feeling our way around the elephant here, right? And just being quite transparent as we do this. Um, there's, there's other patents that I could show you as well, uh, but, but certainly as you're reading this literature, always pay really close attention to whatever graph they're showing you about patents, because there is, you, again, back to lies, damn lies, and so on. You can tell any story that you want about China these days uh, based on which particular, even just patent statistic you choose to show. All right. Um, so with patenting, I would argue, once again, China's very much in the mix, doing real well, okay? Let's look at research. So again, this is a, an index that was created to, to measure uh, what proportion a country's articles, science and engineering articles are in the top 1% of cited articles. And essentially, if your, if your number is higher than one, that means the, the, the higher that it is, the more highly cited articles that you have. And so again, China is looking really quite good along this particular dimension. And then getting to this more uh, commercialization measure, high tech exports as a percentage of total manufactured exports, China is, is one of the top performers there. Okay, so I've shown you a lot of charts here. And basically the picture that I'm trying to, to paint here is that in both inputs and outputs, China ranks as one of the world's most innovative countries. And that this is a relatively recent trend. So we've particularly seen this pick up just over the past decade. All right, this obviously creates a puzzle. This, this raise, raises attention to a puzzle in that there's this very prominent literature within social science that said, they shouldn't have been able to do this. <laughs> Right, this, this doesn't make sense. Like how, how were they able to do this? How was an authoritarian country able to produce innovation? And so uh, by way of answering that puzzle, I develop an argument that, that I refer to as smart authoritarianism. So first of all, I argue that the democratic advantage claim neglects significant heterogeneity of authoritarian regimes across space. So just saying that a country is democratic or authoritarian neglects a world of variation in terms of how different authoritarian regimes govern themselves. So there's a very large comparative politics literature, um, starting with Barbara Geddes in 1999. She talked about different structures of authoritarian regimes, like a monarchy, like a military junta, like a personalist regime. 
like a single or multi-party institutionalized authoritarian regime. And turns out there are very big differences um, in how these regimes govern with very big differences in outcomes that we in international politics care a lot about. And so basically what it comes down to is to, to understand if an authoritarian country is going to be good at innovation, you can't just say, well, they're an authoritarian country. You have to ask, well, what kind of authoritarian country are they? And even more specifically, what kinds of policies are they pursuing? So not just looking at their institutions, but asking, do they provide public goods? Do they provide property rights or some other means of, of reassuring inventors and entrepreneurs? Uh, what is the quality of their bureaucracy? Are they open internationally and so on? So again, expanding the conversation beyond just, well, it's an authoritarian country to what are the specific policies that bear on innovation is that country pursuing? The second argument is that there's tremendous heterogeneity of authoritarian regimes across time. So it's not just that authoritarian regimes vary, it's that recently they've started to vary in some interestingly similar ways. So for example, there's been a rise of people, people talk about it in all different kinds of language. They talk about competitive authoritarianism. You know, I call it smart authoritarianism. Um, uh, what are some of the other ones? Um, my, my favorite one is they say vegetarian authoritarianism, um, which, which is kind of cool, kind of unwieldy though. But, but essentially the idea is um, it accepts the claim that says the world has changed significantly as a result of all those trends that I mentioned. Yes, the world is more globalized. Yes, human rights norms are stronger. Yes, um, development banks are more willing to sanction dictators and deny them funding and this sort of thing. All of that is true. The thing that's not true is that that previous argument essentially assumed a static picture and said, okay, well, I guess authoritarians are really screwed, right? But no, authoritarians found themselves at a tremendous disadvantage. And what they did was they tried to adapt. And so what this represents, what this smart authoritarianism or competitive authoritarianism or vegetarian authoritarianism represents is adaptation. And so what we see, and the, the great book that's out pretty recently on this is the Gareev and Treisman book called Spin Dictators, um, is they, they talk about the different ways that dictators are exercising control that will make them kind of less, uh, look less repressive in the eyes of the international community, not scare away foreign capital, not deny them access to global knowledge networks and this sort of thing. And so with respect to um, the East Asian cases, there's been a, a big comparative political economy literature on the, particularly the development of South Korea and Taiwan um, with respect to providing public goods, having a highly meritocratic civil service. So that was all work that came out looking at the, the kind of growth in the, the catch up stage of development. And then obviously I'm talking about past that, I'm talking about the innovation based growth stage. And there's all sorts of work going on about China today that talks about how the Chinese Communist Party governs today relative to the past in ways that are less overtly repressive, that um, again, engages in low intensity repression um, in terms of censorship, Margaret Roberts book on uh, strategies of censorship that, that basically uh, like by, um, by, by flooding the information environment with lots of bogus information, you also are able to deny people access to information. And so that's a kind of non-coercive method that people, um, again, are just finding that the authoritarians are pretty good at doing. Uh, at, at finding ways to subdue protests that are quite creative and, and often preventative, like so the protests don't even occur. So you don't have to kill people in the, the public square. And then also that you can still have a government controlled civil society. It's not gonna be identical to the one in democracies, but you're gonna get a lot of advantages from it as a government. 
and, and in terms of its con contributions to innovation, but it can also be government controlled in many ways. So all of this basically is pointing to a picture in which we see authoritarian adaptation over time, in which basically authoritarians are performing at a much higher level than we thought they would ever be able to do. So my findings in some are that China has the scale, China has the sophistication to be a great power. And what that's telling us is the unipolar moment as it was frequently referred to is over. We have two great powers. I was never all that good at math, but I think that tells us that we are in what's known as a bipolar era. This obviously has really big implications for American grand strategy, things that people around here care about a lot, for the character of international order, and for um, the, the future of democracy in this struggle with the spread of authoritarianism. We're seeing far more competent authoritarians than we ever imagined. This also has really important uh, implications here I want to highlight in terms of I'm not trying to tell you a decline story. If you look at those, those charts, the US is doing great. So I do not find evidence for the China as 10 foot tall narrative here. I find that China is very much in the mix, um, but I find that the United States is doing very, very well. And if we, if we look past kind of current technology, we see that moving into the frontier technologies of what's called the, the fourth industrial revolution, um, basically, I'm, I'm doing a paper on this also, Basically, the story is about the US and China both being very much in the lead. And so again, this is not a decline story. And then there's a lot of implications here for international relations theories and for, for literatures. And so lots for you guys to unpack someday. Uh, for this, basically my, my findings really challenge these arguments about institutions and economic growth and innovation. There's a, there's a whole IR literature about what's called democratic difference. Basically, it's democracies are better than non-democracies at a whole host of things. And this, this study joins others in saying, we need to go back, we need to visit that. Because again, once you, once you unpack the idea of authoritarianism, and basically what we find out is that um, some authoritarian countries are really, really bad at a lot of things, and that might be driving these, these entire results that people got when they said democracies perform better at a whole variety of different things we care about. Some of the leading studies on this, we've, we've seen some scholars move into this area, um, basically both in the, actually all of them in the this down and saying, um, look, looking not only in how authoritarian regimes are different across space, but also vary over time within the same regime. And so that's another really important part. And then Donnie Ryder also looks at um, the, the different ways that authoritarian regimes uh, coup proof their militaries, which will have different effects on military effectiveness. So anyway, there's these works that are out there that are starting to do this. But this is still a pretty nascent effort. And so we need to do a lot more of this to unpack just, again, what are the effects of regime type on a lot of these outcomes that we care about. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Or is open. Sam, you are. Uh, you're just jumping out of the gates. Uh, so you get the first question, but everyone else, please raise your hands high, especially in the back. Sure. Um, so um, I like this idea of smart authoritarianism. I'm saying the lighter, by the way. I'm a third year PhD candidate. It's nice to meet you, Professor Lin. I was wondering whether or not, you know, in watching recent news and the uh, recent party Congress and what Xi Jinping extends his term, there's been a lot of discussion about China regressing in terms of its economic globalization, which may then affect the degree in which these smart authoritarian policies continue. Is your view that that is occurring? Do you see that this period of smart authoritarianism in China is coming to an end, or do you think it's going to continue, and why or why not? 
I mean, this is just such a good question. Um, this is the question right now. Um, it's the danger of writing a book on something that's kind of a moving target is that I've realized I need to maybe add a chapter. <laughs> um, so let me, let me bounce this off you and you guys can tell me how it sits because this is what I'm literally writing right now. So, um, so I have a couple slides I can show you. Um, I thought we were at the end. They just seem to be circling. Extra slides. Okay. All right. So th this is the question, which is, is the Chinese government essentially abandoning this smart authoritarian policy? And so lots of scholars have pointed, I think, completely correctly to a range of policies that, that Xi Jinping is pursuing. And actually, you guys have Susan Shirk here tomorrow, and she, she dates this to the, like the late Hu Jintao era, actually. Um, basically, the argument is that the various policies pursued under Xi, um, increasingly statist approach to innovation, uh, again, like the financial sector had been going like gangbusters and doing great and highly innovative and everything. And now Xi Jinping is coming in and saying, no, we don't like how you're innovating. We want to innovate in strategic areas that the state cares about. And so we're going to make you do that. That's something that doesn't sit well with a lot of folks that say this isn't going to end well for China. Um, there's a whole host of other things, their foreign policy choices and so on. Um, the abandonment of state-owned enterprise reform, part of this kind of status trend. So there's a whole host of these different policies. And I, I think people are, are quite right to say that we have moved, and, and then repression also, crackdown on civil society, um, censorship, and so on. So we have moved, I think people all agree, that we were in this direction and we're moving in this direction. And so I think I completely agree with that. The, the argument that I just made is that there's this kind of zone of smart authoritarianism. And this view that I just stated says they were in it and they're moving out of it. So that's, that's this argument that you see basically everywhere. If you thought that scholars all disagreed on stuff, this is like the one thing they all seem to agree on. Like Xi Jinping's messing up, China's not gonna be able to innovate. Like this is just the narrative right now. I, I, I mean, they might be right, okay? So point number one, they could be absolutely correct, which is that China managed to get to this kind of sweet spot where we didn't think they could go. We didn't think that was possible. We didn't think there was actually a sweet spot. So just the fact that there is one is pretty interesting. But then perhaps they have left that, they've moved toward more authoritarianism, more repression. Um, an alternative view though, is they haven't actually left the sweet spot. So maybe they're still in it, okay? Basically what I'm saying is, I don't think we know. <laughs> uh, people seem to assert this with great confidence that they know exactly where that sweet spot is, which is interesting because at the time when they were back in 2005, nobody thought China can innovate at all. And yet now they say, oh, that's where we wanted to be. So this argument seems to be kind of evolving is one point. Um, anyway, um, I don't think we know enough about the relationship between innovation and, and repression, and, and we don't know enough about how, what, in what ways do you need to be smart? Do you have to be smart on every single one of these dimensions, or can you hit three out of the five, right? And so there's just too many uncertainties before we can definitively say, like, oh, he's taken China out of that potential zone. 
And I think this is even more important because of all the, the, the different factors that could be involved here. I think that the answer is inevitably going to be conditional. So that maybe there's one country, a certain kind of country, where this sort of shaded area is over here, for China it might be over here, and so on. So I think it's going to be conditional. Um, what might it depend on? Market size is a really big deal. China is not a normal country. China has a massive domestic market. And so if the, if the issue is, is, oh, it's going to lose market access because of Xi Jinping's mean foreign policy, well, that's a really big deal if you're South Korea. It's less of a big deal if you're China, right? So market size might be one factor. There's another thing that, that again, I think people are making all of these arguments without actually knowing much about where innovation comes from. And so when we learn about different kinds of innovative activity, for example, it raises the question of, well, maybe what she is doing will definitely mean that China is not going to be good at these particular kinds of activities, but maybe they'll still be able to do other kinds of innovative activities. Maybe this is going to be felt in different sectors to different degrees. So, um, so for example, scholars talk about um, science-based innovation as opposed to efficiency-based. They talk about customer-focused innovation. There's all these different kinds of innovation that go on at a given time. And so again, it might depend on like whether or not you're here or here might affect these different kinds of innovation differently. Um, there's also the other huge uncertainty, which is we're, we're, China is doing this in a world where dictators have just unprecedented tools of control. And so how on earth do we know how this is going to go down, essentially, when this leader has tools of what we would call soft repression, again, ways of monitoring and keeping people in line that are not as overt as they used to be? How on earth would we be able to know um, whether or not he's going to succeed at staying in power while fostering innovation. So um, the short answer is, I don't know where this fuzzy zone is. Neither does anybody else. OK. Hey, um, my question actually lines up uh, follow up on Sam's question. My name is Diana. I'm a third year PhD student in the, the department. Um, so you coined this uh, t term smart authoritarianism and your product speaks very broadly to the regime type question. And my question is, what, are the, what do you think are the characteristics that make some smart authoritarianism different or more innovative than authoritarianism in general? Um, is China just a unique case of authoritarianism or are there uh, other authoritarian countries that can also fall into this bracket of um, innovative countries? And like, because I, I sort of get a feeling that this can be uh, not a regime type story, but a state capitalism story, or even just a China story. So why why does regime type here matter? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's that's a great question. Um, so China is not the first or the only country to to do this, but. Uh, generally, if you look at the most innovative countries in the world, they are mostly liberal countries. And so, so this is something that is relatively new. Um, if you look at, for example, so the case of Singapore is really kind of the, um, the, the originator of this model. And, and so essentially what you're seeing there is you're seeing a government that's trying to, uh, the, kind of the, the key to smart authoritarianism is this idea of ruling, controlling, using threats of force in ways that are less visible and more targeted because that will um, offend the international community and global capital and um, international institutions much less. And so again, it's this concern for, you know, your your reputation. It's concern for your image because the the people that you want to be in business with 
worry about these things and, and you worry about satisfying them. So there's a, there's a whole big part of this is, is uh, essentially, um, can you target your repression much more than just, you know, mass killings of lots and lots of people? And can you hide it as much as possible? So Singapore is a, is just offers kind of a masterclass <laughs> in this. And actually the Chinese assiduously studied this case, uh, sending people to, to Singapore and, and developing close relations with, um, with Lee Kuan Yew and trying to, to study this, this model. Um, you can raise lots and lots of questions about, okay, well, to what extent can we expect a Singaporean model with this tiny, tiny state to, to be successful around the world? And, you know, it's a very fair question. And especially because we, we don't, I mean, the bottom line is there are a lot of leaders around the world that are ruling in this way of what, what I'm calling smart authoritarianism. Um, this is this, this great book by Gorev and Treisman that, that talk about this. Um, they talk about Putin was, was doing this, and then they, they said there was Putin 1.0, and now he's switched to Putin 2.0, and so he's gone in the wrong way. Um, uh, so various regimes, and interestingly, a lot of them have worked with Singapore in the past. And so this one thing that has really intrigued me about this is the communication among authoritarian regimes and how they learn from each other. So essentially, it's not just a China story, definitely not. And it, it does relate to regime type in the sense of uh, it's, it's about how does an authoritarian government satisfy the various needs that it has to satisfy in terms of um, control of the public and also satisfying that selectorate that you have to satisfy. Um, and the, the previous models that have looked at this, there's the, the recent models that I mentioned, and then the, the whole, um, kind of East Asia international political economy literature that looked at the growth stories in, um, in particularly in South Korea and Taiwan, which were authoritarian at the time, um, those provided a lot of, of clues as well. It was a different stage of development initially, but they ruled in very much in this, this mold. Korea. Um, thank you. Um, I very much enjoyed the presentation. I think I'm, I follow you up to a point and then I get a little bit lost. So okay. my question, the glib way of asking this question is, is smart authoritarianism another way of saying more democratic? Uh, but sort of what I mean is, I follow you when you say that institutions, especially democratic institutions, are meant to solve a problem. It's not the institutions themselves, it's the problems that they're solving that we need to look at that are driving innovation. So the problem is you need to find a way to solve market failure. Property rights do that for us. So what's the smart authoritarian solution to that problem that gets us something that's like property rights, but not property rights so that an authoritarian state can do it and not a democracy? What's the solution to the funding problem? What's the solution to the adaptability to change problem? So how does smart authoritarianism solve the same problems without doing it the democratic way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is countries do this in very different ways. And so there's not any one given way. Um, so, so there, there certainly are cases like the, the Chinese case of property rights, for example. You see both firms and entrepreneurs engaging in kind of strategic activity that they think is going to, like running for a legislature, for example, that they think will result in less expropriation by the government. Um, so, so that's like one strategy that these actors have. And that's, that's not property rights, but it's behavior, it's like adaptation to their regime that have allowed them to face less of a threat of expropriation. So that's, uh, I mean, like um, Yuan Yuan Ong talks about the China cases, she talks about directed improvisation. She, she talks about how in developing countries, you just see these uh, the adaptation to local conditions and and that she very much uses as her foil this idea of like the Washington consensus which is okay we have this idea well you need these things and then you're going to be okay and she said in the China case that's certainly not what happened and around the world that's certainly not what happens 
So the, the bottom line here is it's going to vary tremendously by country. So I wouldn't say that there's one smart authoritarianism model. It's the, the essential problem, again, is um, authoritarian regimes have to provide both private goods and public goods. And, and so that's, that's the tricky thing. And so how can you provide private goods without it being so corrupting that it's going to eat away all of your growth. And so they're, they're trying to do something extremely difficult here. So for, for example, um, scholars talk about different kinds of corruption as being more uh, dangerous for growth than other kinds of corruption. And so that's Ong's story for the Chinese case, like why they were able to grow. And that was also uh, the South Korea story for why you both and Japanese, actually, <laughs> why you saw so much growth and so much corruption in the same economies. So, um, so yeah, the, the, what the smart authoritarians are trying to do is they need to provide both private goods and public goods and because they want to innovate. That's why you need public goods. And then um, they have to repress in a way that is less overt. So it's a combination of providing private goods in a, the least damaging way, and it's repression, but yet a kind of a softer or more targeted repression. Your two finger at Joel Pointer. Well, thank you uh, for that. Um, the only thing that surprises me is one thing you didn't say. You haven't mentioned the demographics of the Chinese situation uh -huh. so far. And I raise it now on uh, a two-finger privilege because I think it, it, it may bear directly on the government's ability to produce climate and public goods. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, um, I would say that demographics are in there's a, another kind of group of problems that people are pointing to with respect to China's future right now. So the, the ability to keep innovating amidst this kind of neo-authoritarian turn is, is one big topic. And so that was, Sam raised that for us right away. And that's, this is a really important thing that people are talking about. The other is just generally after this fast, fast growth period that China's been through, there are all these people are talking about the headwinds that China is facing for its future growth. And so demographics is it's definitely a big part of this which is they enjoyed a very favorable demographic uh, profile, essentially. They had this supersized cohort that was in the working age population, and it's aging out of that, and it's being replaced by the super mini <laughs> generation, which was super mini because of the one child policy. Um, in, in some respects, this is just a completely normal thing. Like, like all rising economies have had its demographic transition that creates that weird bulge generation that then is replaced by a smaller generation. And so that, that's a headwind that every single economy faces. But then China exacerbated the whole problem by the one child policy. So again, the super mini generation is, is coming up to, that has to take care of the super huge generation. Um, so absolutely China's problem is gonna be worse than others. But the, the general trend of having this demographic penalty is one that, that basically all rising economies have had to deal with. Um, it could be that China struggles significantly more than these other economies. Um, but also again, it's, it's not a trend that's, that's unknown. This is, this is again something that every rising economy has gone through. And it's, it's one of these trends that, again, people talk about obstacles to China's future growth, which is uh, environmental cleanup, right? Because they, they went through this fast growth period and they destroyed the, the environment. Now they have to clean it up. So that's another problem. Um, it's the financial crisis, debt crisis, right? So the property market, certainly. So every fast growing economy that followed this investment investment growth model, uh, they all have financial crises. They all have debt crises. And so, so again, this, none of these headwinds are unusual. 
and they are precisely the reason why growth slows at this stage. So, um, so a, a lot of people, when you read articles, they say, like, oh, you know, China's growth can't stay at 7% and it's because of all these problems. It's like, no, <laughs> no economy's growth stays at 10%, 8%, and I'm, you know, it, it, they all go down to about 2% and it's because of all these factors. The, the one area where we're, we're not sure just how bad this problem is going to be is precisely the demographics one. Uh, again, it's not unprecedented. Every economy goes through this if they've had a rise. But because China, the nature of China's is unusual because of the one child policy. And so that is absolutely going to take a big hit on growth. Mm -hmm. um, very so I'm tempted to give Taylor connections and say I have three questions, <laughs> which I do, but I'm only going to ask one. <laughs> you do that a lot. Um, no, various are very good. Uh, they're, they're much more spenders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, not even uh, raising my hand today. I just want to be clear. <laughs> so I guess I just want to push you a little bit and, and to stipulate that I know almost nothing about um, this area. Um, so I'm trying to you know, I'm looking at those uh, the string cheese diagrams that you uh, showed us and uh, um, thinking to myself, wow. And then I'm thinking to myself, how is it that I read regularly the Financial Times, Reuters, BBC, um, New York Times, tech columns? And I can't remember the last time I saw a column that said, the Chinese have done, done it again. Now everyone is going to be forced to compete with this thing, right? The last thing I remember is the Chinese had one moment where maybe they had the fastest supercomputer or something, which was a brute force kind of a project, right? So our business loves measurements, and you dove into the measurements we have. Um, but I wonder if it's possible that this is somewhat illusory, right? You're showing that they are a technological power and they care about these things and they have a lot of activity. Um, they do have a very large population, which means they probably have a lot more people in this business now than we do. So they have to do something. They have to file patents. They have to justify their existence. Um, the Chinese state knows that people look at these things, so they probably do things to try and tinker with them and improve their prestige. So just you know, tell me why all you're just being your usual cantankerous self. Um, <laughs> these are these metrics. Yeah, no, me. <laughs> <laughs> you're never a cantankerous self. Um, I'm always a cantankerous self. But, but you know, tell me why I'm not being my usual just cantankerous self and I'm just missing, I'm missing things. And 10 years from now, I am going to read those articles. This is all the seed corn. And 10 years from now, I'm going to be reading an article every week about <laughs> the new Chinese widget that I just have to have. Should I answer your first question? Or like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is the he other, cutting you off? The other two are much more metaphysical. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before we get to that. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but I'll just take this one. Um, yeah, I mean, again, when I started the project, the the IR conventional wisdom was China was facing this vast gap and was way behind. And as as time went by, I started noticing more of the kinds of articles that, that you're talking about that you're saying you're not seeing. Um, and, and so now you really are, there really are out there the like China as 10 foot tall articles. Um, they're competing with the, you know, um, let's not freak out too much articles. And so, so you, what you see is a debate that's trying to figure all of this out, like where are we? But, but you you are hearing a, a lot of people making these arguments about like, I mean, holy crap! Look look what China's attained. Look what China has done. Um, you know the 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 guy at the Pentagon resigning in protest and saying the United States is falling so far behind. We we don't even have a chance of catching up again. 
right? And so you you are hearing these things. Um, what I can tell you that is going to be my metaphysical question. The metaphysical <laughs> question. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. So so what I can tell you is is that I try to bring my you know berry posen infused cantankerousness to this, and say, okay, you know let's let's not make this easy. Uh, let's let's use the the best metrics that we can possibly use that, that try and get rid of all the, the 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 things that you were mentioning, like well the fact that the government might be subsidizing some of these patents, like 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 I didn't use any data from the Chinese Patent Office, for example. I I use data that is being you know it's competing out there in the world with the the top inventions, and so if if China seems to be doing pretty well according to those metrics, I think it's doing pretty well. Um, I could have put up charts that have this line, right? And, and those charts exist. But again, we have reasons to think that those are not as reliable. So um, oh, that's the argument, the is positive, they're doing well. The, so the positive advice is when you give the talk, list 10. List 10 what? Ten things that I probably should have heard of that I haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the that's the positive. Here's the here's the ten thing. Here's the ten headlines that that you should be taking seriously because these are not bogus headlines. These are real things that China is doing. Just like in terms of technological achievement. Yeah. Here here is a gimmick okay. that is yeah. now world standard, right? Yeah. Whether it's a consumer gimmick or a piece Good of time. capital goods, yeah. right? Well, please. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. A cyber, yeah, a cryptocurrency. <laughs> no, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I would say here too is, I'm sort of dubious as the citation and the patent measure, regardless. But high tech manufacturing does mean something. But in the case of China, probably half of that high tech manufacturing is from foreign investor enterprises, mm -hmm. right? And so the Chinese high tech manufacturing is actually much probably lower than what your chart shows. And so you probably want to find a way to break out the innovative part of the Chinese economy versus the innovations that China is hosting and Foxconn is replicating and everything else. Um, yeah, that, that's the problem with with the, the high tech manufacturing data. And, and again, it's a, it's a totally fair point. And I remember um, my colleague, Stephen Bill, uh, Brooks and Wilforth making this argument. Um, and again, it's pointing to the fact that all of these different metrics are flawed in certain ways. And in the Chinese case in particular, because of its role as being, you know, just part of the global supply, <laughs> less of a part these days, but, but a major center of global supply chains, um, it, it does have a lot of, of kind of a processing trade that it's doing. And so this is a really important point. But again, it's, this idea of triangulation. It's saying using all of these different metrics to capture different pieces of the puzzle. Um, it's also, you know, the innovation scholars, Zach Taylor's argument is that actually this is a pretty good indicator because the countries that, sorry, the firms that, um, that decide to locate in these areas do so because of a level of technological competence. And so, you know, he relies on this indicator. So um, again, Every metric is flawed in these different ways. And so just using as many of them as possible and trying to paint a picture. Um, so we've, I've done a very poor job of innovating my management of the list. Um, there are far more people here that we're gonna to get to. So I'm gonna to try to pair folks together, ask, have them each ask a question, a short question and get back to you. Um, so the first pair will be Jim Walsh and Kaylee. So Jim and then Kaylee and then back to you. And then I'll go to the second pair, maybe. One. Great. Just super quickly on this democratic advantage to innovation literature, which is sort of what I grew up in, it always seems sort of reasonable, but really general, you know, like big statement up here and then results are way down here. But you're saying that they try to adapt to that, adapting not by being more liberal, but by using other techniques like minimizing the visibility of their illiberalism. And I'm just wondering how now having gone through that literature, you know, eight or nine or whatever different variables or arguments, are any of these hypotheses falsified in the Chinese case? Do they perform so weakly that we can say, eh, you know, uh, maybe this one isn't sustained, but this one is, isn't true. 
And then the sort of wacky thing that I'm slipping in, is there any chance that the change in what we see in the charts is not that China changed, but that innovation somehow changed? You know, because it, you had referred to the fact that it had changed before with the information economy mm -hmm. and globalization. So I have no idea. I'm just like that. I like how you slap in two questions. Right? <laughs> oh, oh, you're right. I, no, I shouldn't have done that. Um, hi, my question is yeah, sure. uh, pretty quick. Um, it's picking up a little bit of something that you just mentioned, but I'm wondering the extent um, or what you see as the extent to which China's innovation as being influenced by export controls or restrictions on necessary inputs um, from foreign companies, either in their investment in China's market or in the necessary inputs in order to then um, manufacture it in order to control innovation measures. So the extent to which external controls are in fact related to its innovation. Um, so Great, huge questions. Um, so uh, Haley, start, so starting with you, um, so I'm, I'm just kind of real time trying to figure out export controls and, and what the effect of this is going to be on China and so on. And in, in some ways, we would imagine that, I mean, it, this has already very much been um, influencing China's policy, which is you've, you've seen Xi Jinping talking in recent years about the, the catchphrase being national resilience. Uh, that the need to protect China from the hostile countries that are, you know, trying to be its undoing, and and so the particularly with the the Trump years, this did lead to increasing fears in China about the United States trying to deny it technology. Um, so number one, this is very much motivating China to innovate, to to do, for example, the semiconductor being a very important. Uh, kind of general purpose technology that needs to, um, that, that China is very strong in on certain aspects of the supply chain. Um, this is over time, it's it's just fascinating. If I don't know if you guys, this is MIT, you probably know everything about semiconductors, but you know, with my dissertation on apologies, I somehow didn't get to that. But um, but the the different, many different as, aspects of the supply chain have been very global and in this kind of era of less geopolitical competition, we saw that um, that different countries were content to operate in different pieces of that supply chain. And so China concentrated on one bit, we concentrated on another bit and so on. Um, and so China is now saying we have to get good at all of these different parts. And so the US export controls are, are definitely going to, so they already are denying China like um, the equipment that it needs to to build the, the very advanced semiconductors. And so they are now trying to do this on their own. Um, you know, we, we hear stories and this this gets to the difficulty of trying to figure out just how like what is the status of things there. We hear reports that that they were able to uh, to create like a less this is one of the, the like super advanced semiconductor is less than seven nanometers. And, and so it's like, this is a super big deal. Wow, they went under seven nanometers. Oh my God, this is huge. And then there's the round that comes back and says, well, wait a minute, but they can't produce those at scale yet. And so, so again, the conversation moves on. And so the bottom line is these export controls will matter a great deal. We don't know how much because China's working really, really hard to do this. And because the other really big point is this is unilateral. And this is a really big world <laughs> with a lot of really, really talented countries that would like to export things to China. And so the extent to which um, the US can successfully deny this to China is, is really unknown. Um, but it's certainly gonna slow them down um, to some degree. Um, Jim, on the, the democratic advantage arguments, um, yeah, a lot of them do pretty badly. Um, I, I think the, the, the really meaty, interesting area is in looking at types of innovation, which I kind of hinted at at the end of the talk, and then asking, like, for example, if, <laughs> if, if you're an engineer and you're trying to shave off three seconds on the assembly line for producing your widget, 
do you need to be able to Google Tiananmen Square? Right? And you probably don't, right? Or, or, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm in a liberal arts college, so definitely we would say, well, of course, you need a liberal arts education to do anything. But um, so, so the question would be, what kind of innovation are we talking about? And what drivers influence those different types of innovation the most? There's a couple things that, that I feel like I want to point out, um, being a, a Japan hand, which is, um, I have to say that the China can innovate arguments that were just ubiquitous about 15 years ago were identical to the kind of nonsense that was said about Japan. And it felt a little creepy. Yeah. Um, that, you know, like, oh, they're not creative. And it's just like, what? Um, so that it was very interesting to see those arguments in the US regarding Japan. And then it was a little disturbing to see them rehashed with respect to China. Um, another, another one that is very frequently seen to this day is people talk about the education method. And they say like, oh, you know, China has these examination systems and they, they educate their people in rote memorization. And that's not creative. It's like, okay, did you see where Japan is on these charts? And, and it has the same thing. South Korea has the same thing. And so that's one that's just absolutely wrong, right? Like in terms of at least national innovation performance, give them, give them exams. Like, make them memorize stuff like the they work it out right they figure it out they get good at innovating nonetheless and so the we we love and cherish our you know back and forth and our socratic method and our whatever that we do in the us and i still love it and i still believe in it but it's very clear that other systems produce good results okay, well we're at time apologies to everyone who i didn't get to but uh, please join me in thanking jenny for a terrific presentation. Thank you.